Great. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you to the organizers for this opportunity. Um, it's pretty fun to be here and get to tell you a little bit about myself and my work. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about my work, what I'm calling Towards Autonomous Molecular Discovery, but a little bit about myself first. Um, also, geographically, you know, the obligatory slide, uh, my journey hasn't been as exciting as some of the speakers you'll hear about today. So I grew up in a suburb of Columbus called Dublin, and you might know that we have fields of soybean, fields of corn. We also have fields of corn statues. Um, after some pretty good experiences in high school with chemistry classes and especially with the Science Olympiad uh, sort of club competition events, I decided to go study chemical engineering over on the West Coast at Caltech. I liked it enough to uh, keep going for, for a graduate degree just across the river here uh, at MIT. And so I've had the really good fortune of working with some amazing mentors and researchers over the years. Uh, I just want to highlight them on this slide to really say thank you to them. Um, they've really helped shape uh, who I am today. My very first research experience was with Doug Reese as a freshman in college. And uh, after that, I opted for a couple of internships and then came back to the academic research side, working with Tom Miller. Uh, when I started up at MIT, I joined the labs of Klaus Jensen, Bill Green, and then uh, soon after started a collaboration working more closely with Regina Barzilay and Tim Jamison. And if any of these names are familiar, you probably realize this is not a very cohesive research path. So I hopped around a lot uh, from structural biology, looking then at process engineering, uh, oral recovery, dental functional theory, and then my graduate work now looking at automated microfluidics, and more recently looking at ways of integrating machine learning with synthetic chemistry. So it was sort of a winding road that eventually got me here. Um, but what really led me to this most recent work looking at synthetic chemistry was the obvious realization that it's really important, right? Synthetic chemistry helps support a lot of modern industry, right? Our ability to discover new functional molecules really helps us day to day in the medicines we take in supporting our food chain. And there are really two big questions here uh, that I was interested in, which is first, you know, how do we go through this process of discovering, optimizing, and eventually manufacturing these molecules at a large scale? And then, of course, a related question, can we accelerate that process? So we can think about a really idealized loop of discovery where we're going through these cycles of hypothesizing, experimenting, and analyzing. Or in drug discovery, this is usually design, make, test. And we can think about the different ways that we've used computer assistance to help speed along this process. So we're all probably pretty familiar with some techniques in workflow automation or sort of some laboratory robotics. You can also think about simulations themselves being uh, a mode of computer assistance. You know, there's also uh, instruments and uh, analysis software that makes it easier than ever to interpret large amounts of data. We all probably use literature retrieval systems day to day. If that's just Google Scholar, maybe we have sort of pre-digested information in the form of databases. And then there's also been a lot of work sort of on the statistical design of experiment side and uh, helping us formulate uh, hypotheses and design new experiments. And what really is drawn me to this sort of middle piece of the experimental side um, is that I think there's a real opportunity here because despite all of the advances we've made in sort of decreasing the manual burden of running experiments, so using these sorts of robotic platforms in the lab to help, it, uh, to help us run reactions at smaller scales faster and more efficiently, we still need a very detailed plan to actually use them. So to go from um, an idea of a molecule to actually having that molecule synthesized and enhanced to test, we need a very detailed synthesis plan, and this is still a very manual process and puts a lot of burden on expert chemists' time, uh, time and effort. So if we want to go straight from having an idea of a molecule that could be a very useful functional molecule, we really need to take the automation for the experimental execution and bring it one step upstream uh, to also include the planning. So to do that is going to require answering this question of, you know, what is the best way to make blank? Depending on what that blank is, it could take months and years of time and um, this is, you know, an exercise best left to, to really good synthetic chemists, but if we have some simpler molecules we want to make that could still have very useful properties, it might be easier to identify some strategic disconnections, right, and help do a retrosynthesis to figure out the best way to make it. It doesn't have to be as simple as this. You can still have sort of longer, more complicated synthetic pathways, but you can imagine that the process of this, uh, the process of retrosynthesis is really um, a problem of pattern recognition, and it's one that lends itself really well to computer assistance. And so when we have these molecules where uh, even if they're structurally complex, they might be able to be made by uh, known chemistry, known methodologies, 
And in these cases, we don't actually require too much novelty necessarily in the pathway design for those molecules. And we can think about applying this known chemistry that we've learned over the years to new substrates as a type of interpolation, right? putting these molecules in the context of what is known. A very related question, which gets to sort of the quality of uh, these suggestions and our ability to do this programmatically, is asking the question, you know, would this really work? If we went to the lab and reacted these together, would we get the product we want to get? And so this is sort of the inverse problem of retrosynthesis, right? Anticipating what we might get if we react these molecules together. And for this, we also have a lot of examples in the literature that we can turn to for information. So there are millions of reactions that have been published and tabulated. And for these, we have, you know, we get some information about what uh, reacts together, what major product was formed, sort of implicitly what wasn't formed as well, which can be equally informative. And so if we think about then trying to analyze a proposed reaction without actually going to the lab and trying it, we can think about putting those substrates in the context of what is known based on what we know about sterics and electronics and different reactive functional groups. And this is, again, a type of learned interpolation. So we're putting things in the context of the bigger picture and what is known. So for these kinds of problems in pattern recognition, um, based on the, the nickname I got, I guess you know where this is heading, um, this is a problem where machine learning is very well suited. So uh, machine learning has had a huge effect on a number of different domains, right? Just a few were shown here. But what really unifies these examples and what really lets techniques in machine learning be so successful in these disciplines is that they help us learn complex functions. So we have, um, Image recognition, for example, is going to take a scene and give us label image segments. Machine translation will translate between two languages. It's a sentence-to-sentence -sentence prediction. Uh, in natural language understanding, right, we can go from a question to an answer, or it's jeopardy, an answer to a question. And so these really complex mappings are something that we can't easily write down. But if we have enough labeled examples, we can learn, uh, we can learn the function that relates the two. And then getting back to chemistry, right? Chemistry is full of those complex relationships. So there are the two examples I mentioned of you know, retrosynthesis, reaction prediction, where we're mapping between molecules and uh, one or more molecules. But there's also you know, the bigger questions or the quintessential problem in chem informatics of property prediction. There's been a lot of great work in predicting binding energies using docking models, designing new ligands based on structure, quantitative prediction of reaction yields, and then a, a lot of really good work um, in applying machine learning to electronic structure calculations to mitigate the computational expense of those techniques. So what we've been focusing on for the last couple of years is, uh, is really this question of synthesis design. So focusing on going uh, from an idea of a molecule we'd like to make that could have some useful properties to actually being able to make it in the laboratory. So we've uh, been applying different data science and machine learning techniques to different aspects of synthesis planning and all sort of building towards this idea of having these uh, computer-designed routes, uh, which have been carefully validated, right? So route design is not necessarily new. Uh, we're trying to have an increased emphasis on the validation so that they're well-suited to be connected to uh, reaction platforms. And if you want to hear more about this, um, you can come by talk tomorrow afternoon uh, in ComSci 7. So I think what's really exciting is sort of a bigger question here um, and where I think the field is moving, which is how these techniques are going to come back together with more uh, well-established techniques in you know, laboratory automation, systems engineering, information management, to really change how we go through this cycle of discovery, right? You can think about uh, having computer systems at each stage, but you can also think about eventually being able to design new platforms, which are capable themselves of autonomously going through this cycle and making new discoveries of new functional molecules. And so I think, you know, this is really to first and foremost accelerate the discovery process so we can have access to new medicines faster, for example, but also to, at the same time, enhance our understanding of the underlying chemistry or biology or physics and ultimately reallocate human creativity and really spend our energy focusing on the problems that demand our human creativity. Uh, so uh, a lot of people to thank, um, obviously my family, who I, I forgot to put on here, um, <laughs> But also I want to point out in particular my, my PhD advisors, uh, Klaus and Bill, and then some generous funding over the years, in particular from DARPA. Thank you. <laughs>